In today's big interview, we talk with the leader of the official opposition in Parliament, John Steenhuizen of the Democratic Alliance. John, it's a real privilege to be talking with you today, uh, given the state of South African politics. But we're not going to be talking yet about coalitions and what's going on with the Kuruleni and Johannesburg and all the interesting things you have to deal with. But uh, but I would like to go back to what you wrote about in um, earlier this month about the devolution of the Western Cape. Now, we've been following at Biz News' story very closely because a lot of our community are saying, the Western Cape should secede. Uh, we also have uh, the other side of the coin where people are saying that, well, where would that leave the rest of South Africa? And the interpretation by some of the secessionist parties of the DA being involved in a devolution, an official devolution group, which was created in September, is that they've got you on board. What is the reason for you sitting alongside um, people like, uh, Mr. Miller from the Cape Independence Party and the Cape Independence Advocacy, Advocacy Group. Uh, well, thanks, Alec, and great to be with you. The honour is, as always, all mine, um, and great to be with the viewers as well. Uh, let me first be clear, uh, when we talk about devolution, it's not only for the Western Cape. We're talking about devolution to any competent provincial or municipal sphere that is able to perform the functions better. Uh, the devolution working group was formed to fight for greater devolution of powers to provincial and local government because the members of the group are all of the fundamental belief that the principle of subsidiarity, where government is brought to the lowest common level, uh, is obviously better for accountability, for the quality of services, and the ability to be able to really deliver uh, in a meaningful way. And so while we don't all agree on secession and uh, I've made the point from the beginning. I think the secession debate uh, is going to rage for many, many more years, but that the practicable low-hanging fruit in this whole debate is that we can join forces to fight for devolution, greater powers for provincial and local government, uh, and being able to step in where national government has failed and where it makes sense for those spheres to perform better. So I, I don't necessarily believe in secession, and I don't agree with Jack Miller on that regard, but we can find common ground, and, and, and I think that the meeting was very good. It was a very diverse meeting. Um, you know, a lot of people under the misconception that this was a small group of right-wingers uh, sitting in a corner. Nothing could be further from the truth. It brought together civil society. We had academics uh, and, of course, members of, of different political parties there who believe in devolution. And we're going to continue to fight because we believe that, as I said in the piece, the revolution has failed, the National Democratic Revolution. Mm. We've got to try something different. And I think devolution uh, is uh, is the start for us to be able to give greater powers and get more accountable government. So how is it different to independence? Or are we just playing with words? No, it is, it's, it's significantly different from independence. Um, you have provinces, like you have states in the United States or Lunda in Germany, uh, who have relative autonomy in the management of their affairs and uh, and have powers to be able to manage things in a way they feel better, but they're still part of the unitary state. So the states in the United States of America, you may have Texas, and Texas may have different laws to, say, New Hampshire, but they're all part of the United States of America. So it essentially sees the provinces remaining as part of South Africa, but having greater powers to be able to determine matters that uh, that affect their provinces uh, in a way that is best suited for those particular geographic areas and demographics and uh, you know, and various interests. But, but let's just get practical about this. The state controls the harbours. If the Western Cape had control over Cape Town, uh, presumably it would be could be run more efficiently given that you're pro-business and you would be more open to allowing business to be involved in there than we've seen so far from central government. The railways is another thing, which is a complete disaster. And Eskom, we, I guess we could go on indefinitely, but where at a practical level would devolution be implemented? So 
uh, Alec, and, and you've hit the nail on the head. And that is the problem that we face at the moment because we say we've got a federal system, but we don't really. There's not really a great deal of autonomy. So, for instance, in a province where the DA, um, and who knows what's going to happen in 2024, coalitions, the DA, may win other provinces, you arrive on the first day on the job and the various levers are there for you to be able to improve the economy, improve safety and security, but the majority of them are glassed off and you can't touch them because they're the purview of national government. And some of them are absolutely essential for the growing of the economy. So, for instance, the Western Cape economy relies heavily on agricultural exports. But as you've said, is at the complete mercy of an inefficient port where fruit is left rotting on the quayside because of those port inefficiencies. We're saying give local government and provincial government the powers to run those things. Uh, where it will allow them to enter into public-private partnerships and ensure greater efficiency. Uh, I was recently in Berbera in Somaliland, which is a country that, that very few people around the globe even recognize. Their port at Berbera just signed um, recently an agreement with Dubai Ports World. It's now 184 on the World Ports Ranking Index. South Africa's major port sits in the, in the 360s. Durban, I think, 365, Cape Town, 364. Uh, and it just shows you that public-private partnerships, when it comes to that, works. And I think that provinces and local government should have the latitude to be able to making those decisions that affect our local economies the most. And I think they're a better place to make those decisions. You said the revolution has failed, and Tikang Moseneke has now been widely quoted as, as saying exactly that. But that would presume that the centrist approach is now very weak. Your colleague, the mayor of Cape Town, uh, Jordan Hill Lewis, uh, told me in a recent interview that when the door was just slightly made open for power, he kicked it. He kicked it right open. And now uh, the with Cape Town in a few years' time, presumably the idea is to be completely independent of load shedding. Is that not something that one could see in the provinces? And, and again, the DA is the only party that does have, that is controlling any of the provinces outside of the, the ANC's other eight. Is that not something, is it not now the time perhaps for you to kick the door open on a provincial level? Well, we are doing that um, across the province, across the province of the Western Cape. We've got actually six municipalities that are competing with Jordan in the Western Cape to be the first to be load shedding free. Uh, so Stellenbosch and Jordan are uh, in the city of Cape Town are neck and neck at the moment. And um, Mayor Gersi van Deventhal was with her earlier this week, and she's pretty confident that they're going to be able to pull ahead. But that competition's good, and it's the sort of competition we should be seeing uh, across the country. But absolutely, and that's a good example. And yes, the door has been kicked open. We spent the last decade trying to fight the ANC in court to be able to contract directly with independent power producers at both the provincial and a particularly local government level because the local government level is mainly responsible for the reticulation of the electricity, which they buy in bulk from, from Eskim. Um, the city already runs its own hydroelectric power uh, plant out at Steenbrus, which enables the city to shield its residents from one full uh, level of load shedding. Um, and I think that's a good thing. And I think that, that we have an opportunity to do more. And the door has been kicked open now. And what we're saying now is, well, we're going to step in, whether it's electricity, whether it's the rail services where we're already stepping in, or policing where the city's LEAP uh, program with the province has put over a 1,000 new police officers on the street to fight crime. And it's had a visible result. So the proof of devolution works, and I use the example of Inyanga, which was previously in the uh, the murder capital of South Africa. After just one year of localized policing resources being put in there, it's now dropped out of the uh, out of the top list, and it just shows you local does work. And where it makes sense, I think that local government and provincial government are going to have to step in and shield the people who voted for them from the failures of national government. The reality is, Alec, and I'm sure that you've had many guests on your show, Pretoria has run out of money. The, the government has run out of money. There's, there's no money to do the things they say they want to do, and that's why we end up with broken promises. And so governments now at a local and provincial level are going to have to step in and fill that gap because you can't leave your economy to 
you know, the, the slings and arrows of government failure or government's inability to do its job. You've got to step in now and do something to shield your economy and shield your residents from the ill effects of poor governance. You mentioned money, and, and it raises something that occurred to me at the uh, medium-term budget a couple of weeks ago, where the finance minister was very excited by the fact that we now have a primary surplus. So just for those people who, who didn't follow the convoluted discussions, what it means is for the first time in 15 years, South Africa won't be spending more than it is getting in via taxes before interest payments. It's really, it's, it's, it's playing with numbers because it's like having an access bond that you don't repay uh, and it just keeps growing all the time. So although uh, the, the interest payments are 15% of our, of our total spending, why should people in the Western Cape, why should a DA-run province, for this matter, have to weigh in on these spendthrift uh, practices that happen elsewhere in, in the country? You could do, you could run your province very well through devolution, but if the continuation of the poor governance uh, occurs elsewhere in the country, you're just going to be sucked deeper and deeper into a very dark hole. Well, the goal then, Alex, there is to be able to challenge from power in more places. If you look at Gauteng, for instance, uh, the current government holds on to it with a one-seat majority. That's going to disappear in the next election by all the polls uh, that are showing. And I think that there are many other provinces that are now competitive. KwaZulu-Natal um, really has an opportunity with the IFP to lead a coalition there. The Northern Cape is up for play. Our colleagues in the Free State say there's things to play for there. So the goal is to get more and more provinces out of, out of control of the ANC and then to push devolution. And the fact is the ANC should actually be getting behind this policy because it would mean that the provinces they retain, you know, they may not themselves then have to, you know, subject themselves to the, to the wills of a coalition government at a, at a national level and will be able to, you know, carry on plowing their policies there. And I think that would be a good thing because I think what you would start to see very clearly is far more differentiation around the country. And you'll be able to see this is a government that's working. The economy is moving forward. Jobs are being created versus an economy that's been poorly run and badly uh, managed, and the resultant collapse or, or negative growth would lead voters to think in that, uh, in that province, say, well, I'm going to vote for somebody else next time. And I think your, your politics becomes far more competitive then. I mean, I want to be clear. I mean, I'm not playing for the Western Cape. I want to play for the whole of South Africa. Um, that's where, where my, my goal lies. I'm very happy with Premier Windy and, and Jordan Hill-Lewis and what they're doing at the local and provincial level. But I think there's a lot more to play for, and, and I think the country's up for grabs, and I think there's many provinces up for grabs, which is why this devolution argument is, is so urgent as well, because if you get into power in those provinces then, and let's say the national government remains in the hands of an ANC uh, smaller parties coalition, well, you want to be able to get the ground running and, and roll out policies that will differentiate you from the rest of the country in more places. So it's all about challenging for power in more centres, and I think that's going to be the focus over the next 18 months. We also know that many people are semigrating. People are moving to the Western Cape. Uh, I was talking this morning with R.W. Johnson, who said the number that he's heard is 108,000 families have, have moved into the Western Cape this year, which is extraordinary numbers. Now, that's really good news as far as uh, your prospectus is concerned because it shows it's working. But on the other hand, once the Western Cape has all of these municipalities that are load shedding free and the rest of the country has what, what we're experiencing to the north, which is continued load shedding, isn't there a problem that you'd, you'd have this, this magnet actually just draws too many people to it and makes the rest of the, company, uh, the, rest of the country or puts it in an even worse situation? Well, I mean, the big worry for us there, I hope you didn't tell Bill you were talking to me. I'm not very popular with him at the moment. <laughs> um, but, um, to say that, um, you know, you, what you worry about then is you, you know, your voters are leaving provinces where you really need their votes and coming to a province where you already have a majority. Um, they're also the negative part is that it puts a huge strain on the infrastructure. And I'm sure 
Jordan would have taken you through that. I mean, the city is having to invest massively and the province in infrastructure to manage the influx of both business and residents. And, you know, we've had, there have been some problems with sewerage, uh, reticulation and and water and, and the like, but, you know, that's Jordan's on top of that. And I'm very confident that the infrastructure will match the growth. Um, and it also brings opportunity because with that comes investment and a bigger rate space for your municipalities and which means your municipalities can do more. But it, it does leave me worried about you know, what's what's going to happen in the rest of the rest of the country, because we really need to take control of those provinces. And uh, in our message is we want to bring the Western Cape to you, uh, where you live. And you shouldn't have to semigrate just to get good, clean, accountable government. That it is possible uh, where you live, but it's also determined by how you vote. And I think that's going to be the key message over this next election is that we can do what we've done in the Western Cape. We can do what we've done in the city of Cape Town uh, in your neck of the woods. Give us a majority and we'll, we'll get things done for you uh, as, we've, as we've done in, in those places that you've mentioned. Just help us to understand uh, how you're viewing 2024. And, and I want to take you to an interview I had with um, uh, Gaden McKenzie, uh, uh, who said that he, he likes you because you trade insults on the hustings, but you know that it's all just politics. But he said he's, he's unhappy with the DA because he needs to teach the DA lessons now in certain of the municipalities ahead of 2024, where there is a potential that you guys will be running the country, your coalition. How, how do you respond to something like that about being taught a lesson? And indeed, if, if he's got a point, are you learning any, any of these lessons? Well, let me just say, I think the person who's been learning the lessons is Gayton. The last two by-elections, we've given him a whipping and taken wards off his party and, and won them back. So I hope he's been sitting back taking the lessons. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, I mean, we're all in, in coalition school. I mean, these things are relatively new in South Africa. Coalitions 2.0 as well, I think, are better than coalitions 1.0 from 2016. And I think that having written agreements and where people actually honor them, uh, these are working and working well. Um, but there is instability, um, and it's mainly through some of these smaller parties that trade, not insults, but trade positions and patronage and the like to be able to to get ahead. And I, I don't think that's very helpful for us to build stability because what you want to be doing is giving people uh, giving people confidence that coalitions are a stable form, an alternative form to to governance uh, under a party like the ANC. And I think the musical chairs that have been taking place, particularly in Gauteng, um, has been unhelpful. Um, and I think that the parties are going to have to decide now, are they going to help the coalition project or are they going to hinder it? I mean, we don't need to learn any lessons around governance. I mean, we've got a track record where we govern of good, clean, accountable governance that delivers better services for all the people. Um, and you know, it would be really great if, if the smaller parties assisted us with that rather than, than try to hinder it. And um, the, particularly the PA's approach in places like Johannesburg, Neisner, um, and Ekuleni have been distinctly unhelpful in terms of building the opposition project and that stability, confidence going into um, 2024. So I wouldn't be arrogant to say we've learned all the lessons, not at all. I think there are always lessons to be learned and you can always improve and we're learning every single day. Um, but, you know, this notion that the DA is arrogant or the like is simply not borne out by even a cursory examination of the facts. Well, he says that you need to be partners and you need to recognize that there's a partnership. I think that's really where he's, he's coming from. Uh, and I suppose that is something, as you say, that everyone's in coalition school. Where, where are you learning from? And when South Africans look ahead to the 2024 election, what is it that you think that they should be voting for? And I'm talking about the non-DA voters. Mm. Well, I think that that people need to realize that this is probably one of the last elections that, that people are going to be able to vote and it's going to make a massive difference. Because if we continue on the current trajectory, I don't know, and the ANC retain a majority in this next election, I don't know what's going to be left in five years' time after that for any party to be able to pick up and whether we'll be able to pull out of the dive. So that's why I've told my party that this election is a moonshot election. We've got to get there. We've got to marshal the resources, and we've got to get there, and we've got to achieve it in this election. 
because I, I worry about about the future if the ANC was to say cobble together a coalition with one or two of the smaller parties and continue with the disastrous policy track and continue with the muddling along of the president and in failure to implement the reform agenda that we require. So my message would be get out and, and vote and vote for change. Um, vote, uh, vote for a better future. Vote for a future that would, you know, that of inclusive growth and a new trajectory of hope. But don't A, stay at home and think somebody else is going to build that future for you. And B, you know, the vote is your most powerful weapon that you have in a democracy to affect change. And if you're unhappy with the status quo, regardless of who's in government, make sure you use your vote to express that. But don't, goodness, just don't sit at home. I mean, I'm very worried about the turnouts that we've seen in, in the last couple of elections in South Africa. When I was in Kenya to monitor their election, I think they had a 70-something percent turnout and they were bleak because, you know, it was the lowest turnout in the history. And we, you know, we've been hitting far lower numbers than that for the last three elections and it's been on a downward trajectory. And that worries me. It means that people are opting out and have given up on their vote as a means to affect change. And I think if you look in those municipalities with a DA1 with maybe one or two seats, and the difference that's been made in those municipalities now by using those seats to be able to cobble together majorities, um, I think it shows people very clearly that their votes do matter. And there's no such thing as uh, my vote doesn't count. The next big milestone on the South African political journey is next month with the ANC's elective conference. What's your, as the leader of the opposition, what's your best possible outcome from that? Well, the best possible outcome for us uh, as a political party would be to see Ramaphosa removed and, you know, some RET faction individual put in there um, who would essentially then, you know, finish the job of crashing the ANC onto the rocks. I don't think that's going to be the case, however. And I think that there also comes a time when you've got to put country first uh, above party. And I think that would be disastrous uh, for South Africa if someone like Lindiwe Sisulu or uh, and Kosa Zandlimini Zuma was to get in uh, at that level. So I, I think the president will be re-elected. I think it will be a, a, a narrow margin. But the problem is, and the bigger question that we should be looking at, because there is no real viable candidate uh, on the other side, is who's going to surround him in that top six. If he ends up with the, the same bunch of RET people around him who continuously hobble any attempt to drive reform or to bring change, well, I think he's going to spend his second term, uh, you know, as a lame duck as his first term. And I think that that that, that outcome is going to uh, set very much uh, the trend. But I also think why that trend is important to watch is that when you talk, as I'm sure you have, to people in the RET faction, they're very confident that they've got the numbers to unseat Ramaphosa. When you speak to the Ramaphosa faction, they say they're very comfortable, they've got the majority. Uh, what's nice about that conference is the tide's going to go out and you're going to see which side's not wearing trunks. And uh, that will assist us in, in assessing the balance of forces, particularly when we look, Alec, at the realignment of politics that's going to be so essential going forward. If there's an RET majority in the ANC, well, you know, I, I think that, that we're, we're in for some serious trouble ahead. Um, in terms of building a new majority, because I have no doubt that they will make common cause with the EFF. If the reform-reminded faction are able to win out uh, and, and hold a significant number of positions, well, I think there's opportunities for a further realignment of politics down the line. How's business reacting to all of this? We had Ramaphoria, we had business patting Sir Ramaphosa on the back. Now, five years almost later, uh, we are seeing that all of that was, was false hopes. You guys are traditionally the home for business because of your business-friendly policies. Are you seeing that those who might have abandoned you are coming back to you? Well, I definitely think that people have come down to a thud with Rama reality. So we had the Rama Foria. I think we've now got the Rama reality. And I hope people have, have seen, and certainly that's the, the impact. You see people who were big Cyril cheerleaders, P Peter Bruce, etc., who expressed major disappointment into the lack of action. But I think the important lesson here is that there's no messiah coming to, political messiah coming to save us. 
You know, every time the media puts great hope and business puts great hope in the individual, um, you know, Jacob Zuma was going to do a much better job than Tabo and Becky and you know, much more approachable and much more, you know, somebody we can talk to. Uh, and then Ramaphosa was going to bring the new dawn and the change. I, I think the lesson to learn here is that it's not the individuals that, that are coming to save us. It's South Africans that must save themselves. And we must look to organizations made up of a, of a number of people that are going to, to bring the change. It's no use having a person who agrees with the reform agenda and they are surrounded completely with an NEC that's dominated with people who are anti-reform and pro-radical economic transformation. Because it, as we've seen for the last uh, uh, term of the president, there's precious little an individual can do if the organization is so moribund and so corrupt and, and so awful around you that, that you can't move. And I think that's the story of the last five years. And the talk about a Tabo and Becky return, uh, it's more than talk now. It's, it seems to be gathering quite a lot of momentum, including from the 80-year-old himself. Yes, I do think so. And it's very unusual for previous heads of state to speak out against other heads of state. I mean, you've seen there's, a, you know, there's generally a tradition that that's not what's done. But I think that the former president has been very, very critical and vocally so and publicly, vocally so, around the president's failures. And there must be a backstory there. So him and a few others in the ANC have spent the last year traveling around the country visiting ANC structures. And the talk on the ground is that they were looking at forming what they call an, an arc to exit at some stage and perhaps form a new thing with taking the organization and a, you know, what's, what's left of the, the best part of the organization, uh, which is probably they found the slim pickings. Uh, out into something new. I now think that they've they've seen the weakness that exists now with the presidency and the very poor handling of the Palapala scandal, that they are now smelling opportunity for a, perhaps what they would consider a consensus candidate to bridge the RET faction and, and, and Ramaphosa's side. And I think that we had Motlante styling himself along those, uh, along those lines. And I now think Mbeki's into that fray as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see how things develop over the next little while in, in that regard. Uh, again, Bill Johnson called it edge of the seat politics for the next 18 months. But just finally from your side, how are you going to make that difference? How are you going to get the DA to out of the 20s and into the 30s and become a really potent uh, central player in the in new coalition? Well, I think what the important thing for the DA is to, is to get out there, uh, to stick to its knitting and get as many chips on the table as possible. It does that by making sure that we are able to turn out people who voted for the DA before, uh, to be able to turn out people who've never voted before uh, for the party, and to turn out first-time voters uh, in big numbers, that we end up with a differential turnout in provinces and at a national level. Uh, which is why it's very important to activate the opposition. I think, Alec, you would have noticed the DA has been uh, obsessed about driving issues that matter to ordinary South Africans. We've stepped away from the grandiose political debates and spoken about things that are being spoken about at the, around the dining room tables, the cost of living, the food prices, the petrol. Uh, we've been putting solutions on the table for these problems, including moving bone and chicken to the VAT free list to bring some relief to to poor households so that we can get some protein into people's lives, how we fix local government, how we focus on service delivery. I think that the DA, and, 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 and you're going to see it over this next election, the focus is not going to be on the ANC is bad. I, I think we've won that debate. I think everyone agrees that. From polling I've seen recently that was presented to us, even ANC voters realize that. I think what the focus is going to be is on painting what the future looks like and putting in solutions about how we're going to get there. A good politician is a peddler in hope, and uh, you certainly are giving us that kind of a, a message now, hopefully not peddling, but real real hope into the future. John Sienhazen is the leader of the Democratic Alliance, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com.